So uh, first of all, I wanted to thank the organizer for inviting me to this wonderful event uh, to speak about architecture and urban planning, which is uh, close to my heart. Um, and I had to warn you already that there will be some overlap with the other speeches uh, uh, this morning. Um, cities. Uh, there's no doubt that cities are in focus these days, and it's a part of the literature. So. Um, for instance, Ed Glaser, the quite famous American economist, uh, uh, has stated that this is the area of the Trump of the city. Um, I think the wonderful work done by Kathy and her group says shows that it's not only not only uh, cities are not only winners, but there are also losers among cities, uh, and that uh, is also something that one has to have in mind when discussing city development. So cities are innovative; uh, that's where things happen. Uh, they are magnets uh, uh, pulling into capital and people. Uh, they, they're diverse uh, and potentially sustainable, as has been discussed this morning. Uh, but cities are also increasingly unequal socially, and they're increasingly segregated, which also poses some challenges for further city development. And I'm going to talk about that. Um, and the dominating receipt in kind of carving out the future of cities is to develop compact, multifunctional, and also livable cities. Um, the concept of livability is something that is problematic in itself because it focuses on attractivity of uh, the built environment and functions and not the actual living conditions for people. Um, uh, so in my view, there's a need for a, a critical discourse uh, of that concept. Um, and one of the researchers that have been in forefront in kind of promoting this kind of uh, new um, uh, urge toward developing uh, cities that are diverse and dense is Richard Florida, who is also an economist, um, who has launched these three concepts of uh, technology, tolerance, and talent as the way forward to developing cities that are, sustainably, um, that are sustainable both socially, economically, and uh, environmentally. Uh, so, the question I want to ask is, how is this translated into actual policies? And how may it transform the urban landscapes, for instance, to the projection of architecture, and the actual living conditions for city inhabitants? Uh, so I'm going to say something first about uh, the arguments for uh, making cities more compact and livable. Uh, and then I'm going to say something about Oslo. I'm going to, to present the case of the, the waterfront transformation going on in Oslo. Uh, at least all of you from Norway have seen uh, and probably walked around in this new environment. Uh, I'm going to talk about the role of architecture. And not only architecture as built form, but architecture as um, an idea and representation, uh, which is increasingly important through new techniques of visualizing the urban futures. Um, and then I'm going to talk about uh, possible implications for social sustainability. Um, so the, f the, the former speakers have already um, uh, mentioned uh, the reasons for densifying cities to reduce uh, uh, traffic, transport, uh, and it's quite clear coming from research that, uh, that um, denser cities are producing less carbon uh, and are more sustainable in that way. Uh, and this actually started in the late 80s by two Australian researchers. They, they wrote a book called Cities and Automobile Dependence and they made this, uh, uh, this graph to the left that showed quite clearly, like also Kathy mentioned, that Hong Kong is more sustainable. If you look at just gasoline use or uh, carbon emissions compared to uh, the group of American cities you could find up in the left corner or also compared to Canadian Australian cities and also many of the European cities. Uh, and I've just uh, placed Oslo uh, in the middle there together with the uh, uh, European cities. Um, to the right you can see a different way of telling your story uh, and that's about urban sprawl. So, uh, so this connection is, has to do with density but it has also to do with the, the, the enormous amount of land use uh, connected to especially American cities and Atlanta is the kind of worst case of urban development and urban sprawl. Um, uh, so the same amount of people 
as Barcelona, uh, approximately. But you can see from this image that the, 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 the size of the city and its effectiveness when it comes to transport and moving around people is very different. Um, we've also done some studies in Oslo in a project that I'm uh, heading um, that also confirms the connection between density, centrality, and transport. So the, um, the figure to the left shows quite clearly that the vehicles travel um, kilometers per person. Each is much lower, uh, traveled by car is much lower in the central parts of uh, the Oslo region than the outskirts, which is not a, a big surprise, uh, but it confirms that kind of research. So what are, the, what are the different arguments for the compact city? So I've talked about the environment uh, as an argument for the city. Uh, so there's a narrative that the, the densification uh, and making the city more compact um, uh, is less transport demanding. It's the city's transit, transit oriented if it's more compact. And it's also more resilient uh, towards uh, in relation to changes that could come, like peak oil or, or, or other types of uh, problems. Um, but there are also argu other arguments, like economic arguments. Um, um, dense cities, compact cities, are more effective. They're more smart and innovative. Uh, they're also more economically viable. And then to the last part, which is about the social aspects, which I focus most on. Uh, it is also argued that cities that are dense are more livable, uh, shorter distances to other people, to amenities, and so on. Uh, they're more vibrant and creative, and they lay the ground for economic processes uh, that creates innovation, uh, and they're also attractive to people, tourists, capital, inhabitants, and so on. Uh, and we have some uh, images of different types of cities, and of course, Houston uh, and some American cities in the South and the Midwest are used as the kind of uh, the, the, the scaring representation of, uh, of urban sprawl, uh, while Hong Kong at the other end may be too dense, as Katia has already said something about. Uh, and then Barcelona is, in a way, uh, the kind of city that everybody strives for, including all the tourists pouring into the city, creating a problem for the housing market. Um, so to sum up first, then, what are the arguments for for uh, increasing density in cities and to create what I would call is an architectural compactness. Uh, so it's first that increased uh, population density co correlates with decreased transport per capita. Uh, it reduces infrastructure costs. Uh, it increases innovation when the new inhabitants belongs to the creative class. And I'll say something more about that afterwards. It reduces the distance between inhabitants and thereby may enhance the possibilities for contact between people, uh, increasing social capital. Uh, and it increases the probability of economic gain for developers and builders. And what is the role of architecture in all this? Um, there surely is an entrepreneurial role for architecture. Uh, so first, it, it's, it's, it's a representation of, of the, the focus on, of, on cities and on city building. It's, it's part of a shift in urban political strategies to focus on central areas. Uh, so the dim images you see at the right are from Oslo, and they kind of um, exemplify that shift in attention towards city centers, transforming them, creating livable areas. Um, and these economic imaginaries uh, may be installed more efficiently uh, if they are connected to and re visually represented by buildings in urban space. Um, it enhances the visibility and it also legitimizes projects. Um, so it's quite clear that research internationally show that uh, um, corporate and state actors and institutions mobilize architecture as one way of making political, economic strategy is meaningful. So then to my case of Oslo, uh, the so-called Fjord city. Uh, like many other European cities, Oslo is uh, in the middle of a process of transformation of its harbor areas fra from cranes and docks and industrial spaces to uh, commercial activities, uh, housing, uh, offices, amenities, cultural institutions, and also public spaces. 
Uh, and in also this transformation is called the building of the fjord city, which is actually a plan uh, adopted by um, the public authorities in the city. Uh, so in 2008, uh, the fjord city plan was adopted, but the process started much earlier. The first step of transformation uh, uh, that, um, that um, created something new was uh, when Akir, um, um, the shipyard at Aker Brygge was, uh, uh, was laid down and a, a new space for real estate development was ready. Uh, that was in the 1980s. Uh, so step by step, the harbor areas along the, um, the fjord of Oslo has been changed, uh, transformed, and a new city, a new urban district is going up there. Uh, so in this kind of transformation, architecture is, of course, very important. Uh, it's kind of the frame, the physical spatial frame for, for the development of the city. It's visual, and it also uh, is the hub for all the functions that a city needs. Um, and it's also used as something to attract investors, to attract attention, and it also is a kind of artful expression of something new that's going on, like this picture uh, 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 made by the, the Dutch firm that won the architectural competition for Barcode, which is the kind of icon of, of the Fjord City Plan uh, illustrates. Um, it's also a representation of functionalism and sustainability, like this picture shows of Dronninge Femi Oskata and uh, the part of the Bjørvika and the barcode project in behind. Uh, and one interesting thing to, know, uh, to notice here is that there are no automobiles, no buses, no motorized transport visible at all in this picture, as if they don't exist. And everybody who has traveled down the Dronninge Femi Oskata know that that's really a place where all that is, is uh, kind of fitted together uh, with a lot of conflicts and so on. Um, and then the thing that I'm most concerned with in this talk is the representations of uh, the social life in cities. Uh, because there's a question, who is actually admitted, who's a, who has access to take part in this new kind of urban development? I usually say that this pure city plan is a kind of a contract between public authorities of Oslo and the Harbor Authority and the people of Oslo, because this is public spaces to give something back to the, to the city and its inhabitants, which was also formulated as a goal for the Fjord City Plan. Uh, and in the Fjord City Plan adopted in 2008, it was really also an important part to create inclusive, diverse uh, spaces uh, and also to, 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 um, uh, to build houses that were affordable uh, because, of course, everyone know that this would be quite expensive uh, in many ways. Uh, so, what kind of people are actually um, have access to this area? Who could live there? Who could use it? Who could play there? Um, and I, there's, in my view, there's a problem with the focus on architecture and architecture's representations because these images that feed into political dis the decisions um, uh, display a kind of social life that is not connected to the realities of who is actually going to use the area or live there. It's just a representation, it's a storytelling of, of how the city is going to look. Um, so the Fjord city architecture as it's taking uh, form now is increasingly transnational in form and organization. Um, there are a lot of architectural competitions going on, so it's very project based uh, and it's not very well connected to the overall plan, which is problematic when it comes to social sustainability and housing projects. Um, urban projects are connected to plans symbolically through these representations, as I showed you, and less with plans as guidelines for practices and actual content, for instance, when it comes to social housing, affordable dwellings, and so on. Uh, so one could say that architectural representations provide imaginations of future functionality and livability, in the emerging contact city, but they do not provide an account of actual living conditions and social implications. Uh, this is a, a collage made by a Guardian journalist of waterfront projects around in Europe, from Oslo, London, Stockholm, Copenhagen, Helsinki, Hamburg, and Malmö, 
And one of the um, uh, one of the goals for um, entrepreneurial compact city development is to make something that is special, something that gives a kind of competitive edge. Um, so some of you may be able to spot something from Bjørvika in that collage, but it's quite difficult. And of course, it's all in black and white, so it makes it even more difficult. Um, uh, another thing is that the, 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 uh, the, the composition, uh, the demographic and socioeconomic composition uh, is quite clearly showing that this will not be an area for, for the city population as a whole. Uh, and I think that's increasingly a, a, a challenge that we have to um, that, that we have to bear in mind when we construct our cities. Um, that creating amenities, creating livable areas, um, does not necessarily create access uh, to housing markets uh, and public spaces and so on. And this is uh, some data from um, a survey done by the public authorities in Oslo, the Oslo municipality themselves that shows quite clearly that the fjord city uh, has uh, areas where people are quite well off when it comes to income and capital. Uh, also compared to the traditionally quite socioeconomically, socioeconomically strong areas in the western parts of Oslo. Uh, and it also shows that the, uh, the share of children is, uh, and families are quite low in these near, new areas, which is not uh, not a surprise since they have also a weaker economy than, than other groups in, uh, in the society. Um, so, is this a public space? Access for everybody? Uh, like this picture in the nice summer day of Oslo would kind of imagine, and it is in many ways, it's a public space, accessible for all, or is it a social cultural enclave? That's, that's a big question that we have to ask ourselves in developing redeveloping and transforming the areas around the harbour front of Oslo, and the same kind of questions that have been asked in London and in Hamburg and Stockholm and so on. Uh, and I don't think there has been too much focus on, uh, on um, attracting people through architecture to wonderful outdoor spaces like these by Gale Architects. Uh, we have to focus more on the social aspects, on who are able to use area, how is it accessible for people. Uh, so this is just one example of conflicts of urban spaces that probably many of you have heard of. So that's the, uh, the, the, um, the beach area at Tuvholmen, which is at the western end of the Fjord City Plan, uh, where first the opening hours was from 7 in the morning to 8 in the afternoon, which is quite crazy in Norway where the sun sets at 10 in the summer. Um, and a lot of other restrictions as well. And one could ask, is that really public space? Is that the kind of accessibility that we want for our inhabitants? Um, so I'm coming to a finish now. Uh, but what are the explanations, uh, theoretically? I think, first of all, there's um, the compact, livable, smart cities part of a competitive strategy, which is international, to attract people and capital. Uh, and of course, there are strong forces that regulate the practices of architects. Uh, so you, you can't really blame the architects as a profession or individual, but they're part of uh, a structure of uh, uh, decision making and of public-private partnerships, uh, and also of increasing competition with other architects that also are internationally based. Uh, but then there's also a kind of a cultural political economy so argument, uh, urbanism and architecture has a political and economic meaning, as I illustrated earlier. Uh, they're part of these uh, economic projects, uh, of course. And uh, the city itself, as a built environment and its amenities and architecture is constructed in relation to the preferences and aspirations, mainly of the creative class. So that's problematic in the long run if we want to develop our cities, not only sustainable when it comes to carbon emissions, but also when it comes to social issues. Uh, so my conclusions are that uh, representations and this, uh, the kind of visualizations of urban environments through architecture provide some kind of symbolic power to this compact, livable, and smart city policies. And I think it's a need to problematize the role of architecture and the role of these representations uh, because they're, they're, they're produced as if the real life of social practices almost doesn't exist. 
uh, and they kind of disconnect the projects from the wider city, underscoring social implications. So architectural policy um, that many cities are shaping out these days should be informed by a critique of, critique of the role of architecture, research of social implications, and also socially inclusive and sustainable theories for urban development and change. And if you're interested in this, uh, you should look at these two articles, like all academics, ends with the publications. Thank you. <laughs>